I knew a church that had that design like that in their foyer, and then they had cameras on it, so you could all sit and watch baptisms during the service, and had like this, had this lighthouse and a waterfall coming down off, down into a pool where people got baptized. That's kind of cool, right? I think. Anyway, whatever. Um, that's okay. I like whatever we got. It's good. I'm glad for the blessing. We are really blessed, aren't we? Wow, it's so many good things. I, I really want to say I'm blessed to see the amount of people who've already worked to prepare for Vacation Bible School. Um, and everyone's got stuff on their plate, I know, and yet you find time. Some of you will start your work today or tomorrow night. Some of you have already been pl- planning and working for months preparing this, and uh, I'm sure Tam appreciates it because uh, she's had a lot of her plate too. But uh, we appreciate all of the work with her. So I always love this because it's kind of like an all-hands-on-deck week. You know, where you see many, many people doing things to make it an awesome week. I want to take you to the book of Acts, chapter 6. Again, last week we talked about the uh, calling of the, the seven uh, first deacons, the, the organization in the church, the first election in the church. I want to talk about the first, the first martyr in the church today. And the reason why, but that's not the title I gave it, is it? I gave it the title, The Witness, because that's actually the word for witness is also martyr. And uh, so a, a transliteration would be martyr. And so what does that say to us? Because Jesus calls us all to be witnesses. Not that you all have to be martyred, okay? And you don't have to act like a martyr either. Oh, poor me, right? No, uh, we, we don't really suffer that much, do we? I, I know like some of you people sitting out there at the latte party, getting a latte. I'm suffering for Jesus. Yeah, right. No, that's not suffering for Jesus. <laughs> We're suffering because, well, you might suffer if I have a latte before I preach, right? So I uh, understand that. Um, but in, in Acts chapter 6, I want to look at Stephen. And here is a person who only served the church for a very short term, for a short, short amount of time, and made a great impact. And so I want to talk about him today. So it says in verse 8, And Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great miracles and signs among the people. But some men from what is, was called the synagogue of the freedmen, including both Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and some from Cilicia in Asia rose up and argued with Stephen, but they were unable to, keep, to cope with his wisdom and the spirit by whom he was speaking. Then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came up to him and dragged him away and brought him before the council. They put forth false witnesses who said, This man does not stop speaking against the holy place and the law, for we have heard him say that this Nazarene Jesus will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses handed down to us. And all who were sitting in the council stared at him, and they saw his face was which was like the face of an angel. In chapter 7, there's 50 verses of basically where they, they bring out Stephen and, and they accuse him, and he's standing before the same people basically who crucified Jesus, and he begins to recount how God had moved by his spirit to bring redemption of his people. But there was always a group of people out there who would reject all the wonderful things God does. Here's Stephen. God is working through Stephen's life to perform signs and wonders, and they're mad about it, and they want to get rid of him. Well, it's interesting because Jesus had performed signs and wonders, and they want to get rid of him too. If ever you, people want to get rid of you, let it be because you're doing good things for God, right? Okay, that's what we want to do. So in, in, in verse 51 of Acts chapter 7, it kind of wraps this up. You want to go home and read that, that chapter if you want, or... Or do like I do. Take your phone, open up your Bible app to, to Acts chapter 7, and on your ride home, just let it play with that audio thing, you know, and listen to the story he tells. And that way you have the background. But I want to focus on some of the stuff about being a witness. You men who are, st- I love how, this is, this is Stephen. This is the part that some of you relate to more. You love it when Stephen just tells these people off, right? Admit it, okay? So he says, you men who are stiff-necked, and uncircumcised in the heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, and you have now become betrayers and murderers of him. 
you who received the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. That's a great way to make, you know, friends, I suppose. I, um, so the difference is Stephen wasn't trying to get in with the political, religious leaders of the day. He was trying to be faithful to God as a witness. So verse 44 says, Now when they heard this, they were infuriated, and they began gnashing their teeth at him. All I can think of is Shark Week when I read that. If you know, gnashing their teeth. Um, you know, you know, sharks teeth just want to bite at him, right? They just hated him. But he, this is in response to the hatred and the response of these people, says, but he being, this again, I keep reading this over and over again, full of the Holy Spirit, looked intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they shouted with a loud voices and covered their ears and rushed at him with one mind. And when they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their cloaks at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they went on stoning Stephen as they called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. In verse 60, he says, Then he fell on his knees and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. This is what a witness looks like when it's full of the Holy Spirit. I can tell you what a witness looks like when we're full of our flesh. Lord, get them back. <laughs> That's what we say. Don't forget that we sound more like... Uh, Nehemiah in the Old Testament, you know, or some of the Psalms of David. Lord, judge them for their wickedness. Don't let them be forgiven. But Jesus did the same thing, didn't he? When he's on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The witness of Stephen. We go to Acts chapter 1, and with a familiar verse, they're quoting, Luke is quoting Jesus when Jesus said to them, verse 8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, they're stuck on that first phase, Judea. They basically saturated Jerusalem. And they're starting in Judea. Doesn't really happen until the next chapter. You see, they get out all. They get when they get pushed out of the city. They finally go and they they take the next stages, which we'll talk about next week. But meanwhile, they're in Jerusalem. They have saturated Jerusalem. All the religious leaders had fought with them for a while, and they kind of got quiet. They're waiting to see what happens. But these guys come in from out of town. All right. So. First of all, they were witnesses in that first phase there in Jerusalem. But the thing is, remember this, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses. And also the word martyr comes from that. Not everyone who signs up to follow Jesus says, I want to be a martyr. I'll be honest with you. We usually sign up to follow Jesus because we want to live, live forever, Okay. So being a witness is a call for all followers of Christ. Now, it says of Stephen here, he was full of grace, in verse 8, and power, and was performing great wonders and signs among the people. This is one of the leaders that were chosen to do the work of moving the tables around and setting up for vacation Bible school and things like that, you know, to make sure things would run smoothly in the church. And he was doing more than he was called upon to do because the Spirit of God in him compelled him to be a witness and to talk about Jesus. It's okay to do more than you're asked to do. Did you know that? As long as you, in the right, in the right spirit, you know. It's not a bad idea. In fact, in life, this is good advice whether you're a Christian or not. If you want to tune me out because I'm a Christian online, take this advice. If you want to be employed, first of all, there's a lot of people out there trying to hire people right now. There are three main things I'd recommend. Number one, don't do drugs, all right? A drug test keeps a lot of people from being employed. Number two, show up to work on 
time. I've worked and managed it before. It's amazing how hard it is for people to show up to work on time. And the third thing is, whatever they ask you to do, don't just do the minimum. Go above and beyond. That's great advice for anyone in the workforce, whether you want to be a Christian or not. But we as Christians should exemplify that, especially in the church. As we've taken this same attitude sometimes. Where many of our churches today are full of people waiting to be served. For those who are called upon to serve in the Scripture were those who are full of the Holy Spirit, and the same Holy Spirit is available for everyone. If everyone was serving as God has, has gifted them and called them to, the church would be mighty and awesome. Yet we still struggle to find volunteers. It's not because the Holy Spirit hasn't come. I submit to you it's because too many people who profess Christ have not received the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And it's available for all of us. So, in Acts chapter 22, I just follow the idea of being called a witness. We find that Paul is writing, and he was once called Saul. At his conversion, basically somewhere along the line, they start calling him Paul. And that's another whole story. But he's a different person, and he recounts this moment in his life because he was a witness to the death of Stephen, the very first Christian to die for his faith. And millions have died since then. But he, he testifies this in chapter 22 of Acts, verse 20. And when the blood of Stephen, he calls him your witness, was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. He was called a witness. Now, in the, in the book of Revelation, there's many references to the word, whether it be witness or testimony or martyr. They all come from the same word, mature. It, it talks about in Revelation, then I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark of their, on their forehead and on their hands. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Here's the thing. If you sell yourself out for Jesus, it doesn't matter what they cut off. You're going to live forever. You got it? You're going to come back to life, and you're going to reign over the same people who may have put you to death. But that's not my motivation. My motivation is to glorify him. If you serve Jesus, you'll never be disappointed. In the end, you will be rewarded in more ways than you can imagine, even if you die for Jesus. And many people are around the world. We've talked about that. What is a witness? Like I said, the word comes from Martus here, a witness. It's used 34 times in the King James Bible. How many have the King James Bible? Come on, come on, come on, folks. Don't be ashamed of it. It's okay. All right. I know. How many memorized John 3.16 in King James? How many memorized John, uh, John 11.35 in King James? Yeah, you too, right? Yeah. I think it's just, that's one of the verses probably almost every version has it the same. John 11.35. Who knows it? Who knows the verse? Jesus wept. Shortest verse in the Bible. Come on, you all should know that verse, right? King James Bible uses this word 34 times. And it, it can be used in a legal sense. So a legal sense, it's a, or Jesus said one time, where two or three witnesses uh, agree on uh, things can be established by two or three witnesses in Matthew 18, 16. And it's also the same reference here of the false witnesses who made up accusations against Stephen in this story. To give a witness is to accuse or to testify. So the word here, testify as well. Your testimony is your witness. Also is used in a historical sense. It's like for those who are spectator of something or anything. Think about something in the history you watched on TV. Like I remember back when the, when the space shuttle exploded. My wife was watching it on TV. She was witness of it. She was watching it live. It wasn't like a recording later on. She was watching it live. And you're all excited. Oh, people are going into space. And it explodes before your eyes. That's a, that has a profound impact upon you when you see something like that and witness it. Some of you witness accidents. You witness things in your life. Those who have PTSDs from, from war, from other things, because of something you witness, it's impacted your life. That is to be a witness in a historical sense. But also to witness or to tell the story of something like he was telling the story of the Israelites and the rejection of God by the leaders down through history. He was giving a witness and a testimony in a historical sense. But there's a third way to look at this, and that is in an ethical sense. 
to be a witness or to be a martyr are those who after his example have proved the strength and the genuineness of their faith in Christ by undergoing a violent death. And there's references to martyrs all through the Bible. Revelation has several of them. Chapter 2, it talks about martyrs. And chapter 6 talks about martyrs. Chapter 17, chapter 20, all kinds of references to those who martyred for their faith. And the root word is witness. It's the same thing. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be my martyrs in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. You may not die physically for your faith, but if you're going to be an effective, listen, if you're going to fall asleep, get this right here, okay? Right now, wake up. This is the point I want to make. If you're going to be effective testimony for Jesus that results in powerful things, you do have to die. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live the life I live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. He had already died. And you know what? You can't kill a dead man. Nor can you stop a dead man. And that he wasn't stopped. You see what I'm saying? An effective witness is not self-centered. He's God-centered. He's already died to self. And he lives by faith in God in every way of his life. How did that carry itself out in, in the life of Stephen? Because Stephen is a great example of what it means to be a witness full of the Holy Spirit. Now, I, I can tell you about witnessing. I, I used to be motivated by guilt, okay? Like, i got to lead people to Jesus. you got to lead people to Jesus. So, so I, I figure out one way to do it is, is find a captive audience. Like, you know, be like a chaplain in a prison, right? Next best thing is find someone who doesn't intimidate you who's hitchhiking. That's kind of hard to do for me, okay? So I saw this teenage boy one time. I'm in college, and he was, like, down in the Carolinas somewhere, had a ride, says, looking for a ride to New York. Well, lo and behold, I'm going to New York. And I'm driving my Volkswagen Squareback. Okay, you know what a Squareback is? It was just a little bit better than a bug, all right? It had a fuel-injected engine, but it was still just as small, you know? And so I pulled over, said, where are you going? So I'm going to Poughkeepsie, New York. Well, you're in luck. I'm going to Long Lake, New York, as if you know where that is. But we're going right by there. So I picked him up, and I was determined to be a witness to that boy. He's either going to get saved or get scared to death. One or the other, ride with me. And I went through everything I knew, and I, in the flesh, I led him to Jesus. And I was like, I put a mark on my Bible, and he got out of the car, and he wasn't changed one bit. i be honest with you. At the other time, though, being a witness full of the Holy Spirit, oftentimes happen, you don't even realize you're being a witness until later on. We try so hard sometimes. Look at Timothy. First of all, he was elevated to position in the church to do something. Because, first of all, the pastors couldn't do everything. All right? We rely too much on pastors. We have a specific role we looked at last week, the ministry of the word into prayer. And, and sometimes we want the pastor. You do not want this pastor to make the decorations for vacation Bible school. It would look pretty bad up here if I did, Okay gifted people, and people who are skilled and able to do things, and people who have proven themselves to be of the right character get elevated. So Stephen, first of all, had a life that was exemplary, and people watched it and recognized as someone who was full of the Holy Spirit, and it was the people uh, and the believers who chose Stephen because of the qualities demonstrated in his life. And he continued to do it, and above that, as they put him in position Things started happening under his leadership and signs and wonders. I wonder what those signs and wonders were. You think about it? I don't know. Maybe because you know, he was put in charge of the tables and the feeding of people. Maybe he started, maybe, you know, people brought in like one casserole and they fed the equivalent of five casseroles. I don't know. Maybe he started doing things Jesus did like that. You know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe someone left the lid off the baptistry and he walked across. I don't know what he did. I know what the signs and wonders he did. Figured out. But I believe they all fit into the purpose and the plans of God. And people said, wow, God is with this guy. That is a witness. And maybe he never did any of those things. But it was getting the attention of people that God was alive and real in his life. Signs and wonders. See, signs and wonders are basically this. It's when you see something happen and you really wonder how it happened because God did it. You know, I'm not looking for signs and wonders like, you know, 
fire from heaven. We have electricity in the sky all the time, right? I'm not looking for miraculous things to make you wow me and, and put more money in the offering like I do on TV, whatever. What I would like to see, though, is the wonders of God revealed to people in such a way that people who are going one direction turn around and go the other direction and follow Jesus. I want to see lives changed, miraculously transformed. That is a sign and a wonder in my mind. That is the fruit we're looking for as believers in Jesus Christ. It's not just that we have great buildings built, not just that we have great music, or we have whatever it is in spectacular things online. We're doing a little better, by the way, this week online. I want you to know that we have some upgrades. Go watch it later on. But that's not the thing. The biggest sign and wonder of all is a transformed life when someone was dead in their trespasses and sin, and they find Jesus, and they come alive by the Spirit. That is a sign, and that is a wonder when someone's life is changed. I love hearing people that I knew before they were saved talk. I say, wow, you're not the same person. Oh, yeah, you look like the same person, but you're different because Jesus has come into their life. The signs and wonders. People were probably being saved as a result of the way he served the tables. I don't know, but you I probably, like, I walk in like, hey, can I sit at one of Stephen's tables? You know? I mean, Philip's pretty good too, but he might make me move to, to, uh, to Samaria next chapter. That's another, that's another story. All right. Stephen was doing a great job in ministry because the people recognized it and put it in the right place. And he served there. Second thing about it, here's Stephen's testimony. Let's look, look at his testimony. Because although we could focus on that time, he really told those people off. Don't you love it? I know it. You, a lot of times we love it when something's pulled off. You know, but before you get to the part where Stephen is telling them off, look at his witness before that. Because first of all, it says in Acts 7, 1 through 50, you have this telling the story and his testimony, and he have his, his reference in chapter 6 as well. But first of all, it says of him in chapter, chapter 6, verse 8, it says, St- Stephen, with power, he testified. With power. And that is the word dunamis in the Greek, which sounds a lot like dynamite. Okay? Now, I like that if I want to blow something up, okay? But you don't have to blow people up with your testimony. But the power here mean he, meant he had energy. You know, it's like when we tell somebody the good news, does it sound like good news? I'm just wondering, does it? By the way, the good news is that you're a terrible sinner. That's not the good news. That's the truth. The good news is no matter how much you sin, God loves you, and he wants to save you and forgive you and transform you and give you something you never deserve. He wants to pour out his grace and love upon you no matter what you've done wrong. The good news is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we ought to put a little energy into that. You know, kids, you know, for vacation Bible school, we want people who are a little bit ex- more expressive. My wife teaches preschool. We didn't know that. And, and she talks in a certain way to keep their attention. She loves to read books. And she talks to me the same way a lot of times. I might explain a lot to you, okay? And it's amazing how she gets so excited about stuff. And I thought, you know what? But if someone's excited about something, I might want to listen to them. I mean, I even love, I love listening to my wife tell, read books now, you know? I don't, don't read me anything, you know. Just read me those books about the letters and things like that and colors. And I might learn something just to listen to the enthusiasm in her voice. I love that. And some of you people, you, te- you teach little kids, you're fun to listen to. You're fun to talk to. By the way, though, if you're ever in a school system and, and you have kids like in first and second, third grade, and they have those back-to-school nights or those parent-teacher conferences, they take twice as much time to talk. You notice that? You get third, fourth, fifth grade, you're in there, five minutes, you're out. When you get in there with a first grade teacher, kindergarten teacher, they take a long time to explain things. But they keep the attention of kids. And people who do not know Jesus Christ have a hard time keeping attention with some of the lack of enthusiasm we have about Jesus. You know, I know. You've got to be careful. We want to be labeled a charismatic. Well, I've already been labeled a charismatic, okay? So forget it. There's a story behind that I'll save for another time. But the idea of this is, to, is he had a testimony with energy, but also the word implies he had a
ability. So when he went and told this big, long story that you haven't read yet because I told you to go listen to it later on this afternoon, he knew he had knowledge of the history. He knew the scripture. He could share the story. It was personalized. He could take God's word and he could apply it to the present situation with power, with enthusiasm, with ability, the power of God. And then as a result of his life being surrendered to God, God's power worked through Stephen in his life. Do you have a testimony with power? You can. Second thing about his testimony is just, it, it was with grace. Now, I'm glad I took enough Greek to get myself in trouble. And tomorrow, at staff meeting, Pastor Craig and I will have a conversation. He'll straighten me out. <laughs> I said something the other day that someone straightened me out after Bible study, too. That's fine. But I know that the word for grace in Greek is charis. And it's very closely tied to the word used for gifts. And grace is a nice word. Yeah, grace is, it's, it's, it's kindness and favor and blessing. So Stephen, when people went to his table at the church, he was treating them with favor and blessing. And he was blessing the people as they came in. And it was, he was kind, gracious is what that word means, right? So his witness was in this character, though he had power, he had enthusiasm, and he had ability, he was kind and gracious. Oh, Lord, give us some graciousness in the church today. I'm tired of the fighting and backbiting in our church over every little thing. As I said last week, we need to focus on Jesus and come together and give each other some grace the way God has given us grace. With grace. In fact, I love the scripture verse in Colossians 4. It says, your speech must always be. I, I need to emphasize that. Your speech must always be. If you hear this verse of Scripture and you're not convicted, well, you're doing better than I am, okay? Your speech must always be with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond to each person because each person is different. And we need to learn how to season things differently. My wife likes to cook chicken on the grill. And she gives me that seasoning that's like a poultry seasoning. I think it's disgusting, but that she likes it, okay? For her sake, I put it on her chicken. I like red meat, although I may have to cut down on it based upon my last doctor's visit. But anyway, I like red meat, and I like putting a different type of seasoning on it. We have different tastes. I'll put some of my red meat seasoning on that chicken next time. That's what I'll probably end up doing because I can't eat that much red meat. But the thing is, we all in the world, we have to be flexible and listen to the Spirit, and we show grace to each other. Because God shows grace to us, and we need to love each other. Let them see the love. You'll hear the old saying, people don't care how much you know till they know how much you care with grace. Third thing, Stephen's witness, his testimony was with power, it was with grace, it was with faith. Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Ghost. Acts 6, 5 says he had faith. In the King James, it says in verse 8 that he had faith, but the same word is translated grace in most other translations. But it's okay because it is in the whole context. He had both faith and grace, all right? So we have this, he had faith. Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. I'd submit to you, if you've been filled with the Holy Ghost, you will have faith. You'll believe. You'll have confidence. You'll have hope. You'll have trust in God. You will believe there's a possibility that the worst sinner out there can be transformed into a follower of Jesus Christ. Not just a follower of Jesus Christ, but a promoter of Jesus Christ. You have faith to believe that we'll have a great vacation Bible school. And we don't know how far reaching that will be. I'll get to that in a minute. You know, you already heard this, so just take it quiet for a minute. So I know what God can do through the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I know what he can do through all the work that's gone on this summer. I know the seed that was planted at vacation Bible school last week at the church up the road was good, and our families benefited from that. I know that the seed that was planted in youth camp last week and it'll be going on across our district and all around this country and all kinds of vacation Bible schools children's ministries and adult ministries. Listen, I have faith that God makes a difference in this world and he's not done with us. With faith. Stephen, a man full of faith. Not just a little bit of faith. You know, listen, a little bit of faith is pretty amazing. Mustard seed faith, Jesus talked about, right? He wasn't just a mustard seed faith guy. He was full of faith. 
full of it. Faith. He believed. He acknowledged. He relied upon God. Sometimes we sell ourselves short. We sell God short. What he wants to do in our life, our ministry, in our church. Because we, we aim for a mustard seed faith. Well, I just need a little bit of faith. No, Lord, we need a lot of faith. We need some people like Stephen that are full of faith, that challenge us to go farther and to believe more. He was a man full with wisdom. There was two names in here. If you want to name your kids something, some of you are still having kids, whatever. We're a little bit past that. I, I can't convince my wife to have any more kids. One is the word grace. I love that name, grace given. There was someone in, right here this morning who was sitting here named Grace. I said, another good word is also in the scripture here is the word for wisdom. In the Greek, it's Sophia. Anyone have a relative named Sophia out there? Yeah, a great name. I love that name. It means wise. So if you want your kid to be a good student, name your kid Sophia. If you want your kid to be Miss Congeniality, name her Grace, right? And let them live up to their name. Wisdom. It's insight. It's skill. It's intelligence. It's not the type of wisdom the world calls wisdom. Because there is a demonic wisdom out there. It's subtly disguised in different ways. And it's talked about that in James. This is the wisdom that comes from God. And this wisdom is available to us. He says that, that if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and he will be given, it will be given to him. How many parents out there ever ask God for wisdom? <laughs> All right. How many at work stop in the middle of a difficult situation and say, Lord, I need wisdom. I don't know what to do with this, right? There's some real challenging things. Amen. Listen, isn't that great? We have a resource with God Almighty. Lord, I don't know how to do this job, but you do, so help me to do it. How many have ever hired to do a job you knew cool, no clue what you're doing? Okay, just me. Right? Oh, thank you. One on hand. Right, thank you. You say, yeah, pastor, it shows, too. Right? But God has all the knowledge and the wisdom I need. So if I can just know how to pray, I can learn wisdom. In fact, his wisdom was so, so good that all these, these wise guys came from all over the, the known land. It's about this group that was part of the synagogue of, of freedmen. They came from like over by Egypt. They came from other areas. One of them was probably Saul from Tarsus. These guys, many of them may have been like trying to prove themselves to the Jewish leaders there in that town. And because they may have been like Hellenistic Jews, which are kind of like second class Jews. We talked about that last week. And they wanted to prove themselves, so they're trying to take on Stephen. This is the big conversation. Now, the local Jewish leaders kind of given up on dealing with these Christians. We'll wait and see what happens with them. These guys come in and start an argument with Stephen, and they could not get anywhere with him because his wisdom was from uh, above, was from God, and their wisdom was from the devil. Anytime God's wisdom encounters the devil's wisdom, God's wisdom wins every time. This guy was full of wisdom. How we want that kind of wisdom? I do. You can have it. There's another thing about his testimony. Through it all, he had a vision. And it got clear as he went. Am I found the right one? Wisdom, vision, faith, grace. Yeah, I've got it up there. Okay. It says being full of the Holy Spirit. Again, reference that. Being full of the Holy Spirit, he looked intently into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I, the heavens are open and the Son of Man is standing at the right hand of God. He intently, it says, looked into heaven. Hey, when you're facing opposition and struggles and trials in your life, whatever it is, just intently look to heaven. Intently look for God. In fact, the Bible says, blessed are the pure, pure in heart, for they shall see God. So a lot of times we don't see God because our hearts aren't pure. So we just take a step back. Lord, if you need to help me with my heart, maybe it's not right. Purify it so I can see what you're doing here. See, this is not talking about just someday when the skies open up and we all are taken to heaven. This is talking about while he was still alive, he hadn't been stoned yet. While he was still alive, he had a vision of Jesus right now standing up, watching what he was doing. He was working with Jesus side by side. So they were working together. He was testifying of Jesus to Jesus, and Jesus was with him during this moment. We don't have to wait till we die to see Jesus. Open your eyes. He's all around you right now. He may not look like 
that picture on the wall you have at home, but he is with you right now. Open your eyes. So the type of faith you have, the type of witness you have, the type of experience you have, if you're full of the Holy Spirit, he gives you vision. Vision. And then last, last part of this, and there's one more thing after this, but he had a testimony and a witness which he used with his whole life. His whole life became a witness. He was willing to die for what he believed in. Now, that's a lot to ask, isn't it? Listen, there's only a few things worth dying for. And it's not Chick-fil-A, okay? I know some of you think it is, all right? It's pretty good, but it's not quite worth dying for. You know, people die for their fighting for their nations, I, and I applaud that. But the greatest battle to fight is, the, is a grand battle of all, between good and evil, between God and the devil. And the fight on God's side is, is, is not going to be bad. For, it talks about the great reward we have for those that do. It's being willing to die. You may not die, but you live like Paul, a long life, already dead. They can't kill you, and you can't be defeated that way. So he gave his whole life with our, when our, listen, when our, what our life needs to be right now, as we are living, is hidden in Christ. It's not about me, my personality, my, my desires, what I want. It's not about my pleasures, and, and it's not about me being comfortable. It's about Jesus be reigning. So when people look, look at me, they don't see me, they see Christ. If I can hide behind Christ somehow. In fact, there's a scripture verse that talks about being hidden in Christ. And if we're hidden in Christ, Christ is revealed to the world. Scripture says this. Therefore, if you have been raised with Christ, that's your salvation, all right? If you've been raised with Christ, you've received Christ in your heart, you've been born of the Spirit, you've been given life. If you've been raised with Christ, he says, keep seeking the things that are above. You know, keep intently looking for God and his stuff. Be determined to do that. Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died, already died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. His whole life was a witness. That means he lived today the way he drove. He was a witness. And we are always a witness when we drive. Sometimes we're a bad witness about the way we drive. The way you tip at a restaurant. How many here work in that industry? I'm just, this is for you guys, all right? You deserve tips. And, you know, and by the way, some of you Christians have been around a while. It's not 10% anymore, okay? I want you to know that. It's gone up. <laughs> I had a minister tell me that. Well, we don't give more than 10% to the Lord. I said, you can, <laughs> all right? <laughs> Everything we do, the, the, the way you post on Facebook, are you a witness? Does it include grace and favor and love and wisdom and faith? Is it optimistic? Hey, I, I, a lot of us, have we, we've been working on it this year. A lot of us have been really trying on that one. I know I've posted some pretty bad things on Facebook in the past. And you know the devil is called the accuser of the brethren, and he has a Facebook page, I'm pretty sure, okay? And he's probably following you and me. And he'll use someone else to remind us how we... Do everything we do. It is a witness. Your whole life is, listen, are you ready to give your whole life to Christ so that everything you do is a witness? That's when the world gets turned upside down. That's when things really happen. And here's the last thing. Stephen's greatest fruit was Paul. Stephen's greatest fruit of his life, he never realized in this life. Maybe maybe if he can watch from heaven. I know some people think that people are from heaven watching down. I don't know why they want to watch this mess, but that's okay. I would just look at Jesus the whole time I'm up there, all right? I say, thank you, Jesus. I just want to look at you. I just want to look at you. Don't let me look back at that. I'm done. I'm relieved from that. Thank you, Jesus. But anyway, if he were to look back and see what happened to that seed he planted in the life of Paul, it's amazing what happened. I was sharing that this year is the first time I ever did this. I bought seeds a year ago, but I bought seeds, okay? <laughs> I planted them this year in a cup in our house, put it in the garage for the sun, and it started to grow. 
And then whatever did come to life, I took outside and planted in my little garden, which is not much bigger than my Volkswagen, okay? So, and that little seed grew up and produced these big leaves and this yellow squash. And boy, is it good. I didn't believe for a while it actually happened. I'm used to going down to my neighbors and buying their squash, right? It's amazing what that seed did over a few months' time. Stephen was careful to say, Father, don't hold this against them. And Paul, who was the one who was holding all their coats and given an organization who was then called Saul, was listening to that, heard those words, recounts them later on, and the gospel seed was planted in his, the worst enemy that you might have that day. Today we say, Lord, here I come. I'll lead these sinners of this sinful world. Let them get what they deserve. No, but full of the Holy Spirit, we sense what God sent. Because he came to save your worst critic. He came to save your worst enemy. He came to save that, that person that abused you. He came to save that person. He loves them. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, you can love them too. You can forgive them. You can pray for what's best for them. The person who hurt you the worst, but not without the Holy Spirit, can you really handle that? Paul went on to preach in all these countries where Stephen never went. He went on to write books of the Bible. There's no book of Stephen, but there's lots of books written by Paul. But we can thank Stephen for that. Think about that. Who might be among the children you served this week? The teens you served last week. Who might be among the children and the, perhaps the parents and the, their potential influence is a great motivation for us to be a Holy Spirit-filled witness. Who do you work with? Who do you run in? Who is the one that bugs you the most? If we can be a Holy Spirit-filled witness to them, think of what God can do. Have some faith and believe in God. My challenge to you is to be a witness. To be a witness of His power. Because in Christ there is power to save from anything. He is mighty to save. To testify, to be a witness of, of his grace and to share his grace, his blessings and favor. Pour it out on others. Let it be said of the people from Pulaski Wesleyan Church that they're the best tippers of any restaurant in town. <laughs> Maybe you should go out less and tip more. Be a witness with faith, with assurance, with hope, with confidence, with optimism. Testify. Be a witness with wisdom and skill and knowledge and insight from God. Praying as you do it. Be a witness with vision. See Jesus. And be a witness with your life. Pour it out as Stephen did. Know that it will make a difference, even if you don't see it. Now, it says in Scripture they presented the seven people to the apostles. And they after and after they they brought them forward, they prayed and laid their hands on them. I want to invite everyone who's working in vacation Bible school or doing any type of ministry you know of to come forward. I want to pray for you. So we have all the staff in vacation Bible school. Anyone doing anything. I don't care if you're if you're just if you're just if you did something already, okay? Maybe you did all kinds of work. Yeah, come forward. I want you to come forward. We're going to pray for you. Now, think about this. We, we, we should have more than seven up here. They only have seven in the book of Acts. Think about the potential of what God can do with this group of people serving in vacation Bible school. Amen. Come on up. Now, all of you are going to take part in this because it says the congregation laid hands on them and prayed for them. I don't care if you're worried about COVID or not. There's some, there's some hand sanitizer back there if you're worried about it, okay? Put a mask on. I'm going to ask the rest of you that, are, that you'll commit to pray for and with them. Would you stand, some of you come out around them and lay hands on them, or just put it over their head and just kind of be careful, you know, whatever. Just put your hands and pray for them that the Holy Spirit will come upon them. That's what we're going to do right now. This is very biblical, very scriptural, because I don't want to just play games with God's work. Amen?
We want God to do something, and we need the power of the Spirit to have this happen. We can't do it in our flesh. We can't be a witness like Stephen without his Spirit filling us. And I want to ask you one more thing. If you're out there and you've asked Jesus Christ into your heart, you've never done this before, I want you to say, Lord, have all of me and fill me with your Spirit. Would you do that? Be open to the Spirit of God coming upon you like he did Stephen. We want all of what God has for us. We don't want to play no mamby-pamby games. We want it all, all right? God, in Jesus' name, we pray before you as you did, as, the, as our, our forefathers did in Acts in Jerusalem. We have people that are skilled, people that have been chosen, they've been selected, they've volunteered, all kinds of things to do this week. And Lord, there's such a tremendous potential. By faith, we see it. Oh God, our vision is growing of what you can do in Vacation Bible School, what you can do in the lives of everyone in this church, not just here, but where they work, where they serve, where they go to school, and into the fall. So in Jesus' name, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name that you fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we might be the type of witness that we just read about, Lord. A witness with power, a witness with faith and with grace, a witness with wisdom, a witness with a vision, a, wisdom with all, a, a witness with all of our life, Lord. May we glorify you. And God, give us the fruit like Stephen saw that day. Lord, we surrender our lives to you. May your spirit fall on us as it did on Stephen and all the people. And Lord, may the signs and wonders be all for your glory that you will do among us. We receive it, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Woo, we got more than seven up here. Watch out, world. Let's go get them. Amen. Yes. All right. God bless you. Dismissed. Stuff, I guess, right?